Hi everyone, this is going to be the video about solids from unit three. Um, here we are going to really focus on just that solid state. There we go. So we're going to look at the different types of solids. We're going to classify them based off of their structure, their properties, and we're going to talk about uh, where you find them. So again, we are just going to be focusing on the solid state right here. We're not going to be worrying about anything else. And we're going to start with the types of solids, the properties of solids, and we'll get into the specific types of packing. Now, in general, when we talk about solids, solid is the structure that has the least amount of molecular movement, okay? Now, what that really means for us is that when the particles are stationary, there's the least amount of movement, and they can either be in a crystalline state or in a amorphous state. Now, crystalline solids are gonna look just like this. They're gonna be structured. They could be ionic compounds, they could be metals, but they're gonna be very, well, pretty. Amorphous structures, um, are going to be more disordered. They tend to be more like large molecules that are kind of aggregated together rather than uh, a nice crystalline arrangement. There we go. Now, if you look at solids, the difference in crystalline and amorphous, if we're talking about a large molecule uh, or a molecular structure. Sometimes you could have molecules that are bonded together and held in this rigid arrangement. Or you could have solids that are molecules that are just kind of aggregated. You can kind of see there's no set arrangement. Like these are not all aimed in the same direction. This one is aimed down, this one's aimed up. It's just kind of wherever it fell. So crystal structures are going to have a 3D arrangement of atoms that is going to be repetitive. Now, we also call this a crystal lattice sometimes, and I will tell you there are a ton of chemists that spend a huge amount of time trying to use x-ray crystallography to find the crystal structure of their molecule. And, you know, that's, well, I guess that's fun for them. I don't know. I'm looking at the same thing every day. Unit cells are going to be the smallest portion of that structure. It's going to be the repeating unit, kind of like how uh, a Lego would be used to build bigger structures. It's just that it's going to be the same as all of the other particles that build it up, okay? There's no variability here. Now, the way that we can pack a unit cell is going to specify what type of structure we have. We're going to look at the type of packing, the type of unit cell, and the coordination number, or how many neighbors each atom has for several unit cells, okay? Now, I'm actually really excited. I'm hoping that the videos in here work. I've never really done this much with this material before, but I think it's gonna be really helpful. So let's look at the first one. Here we have a simple cubic unit cell. It is gonna be repeating, you have an atom, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. You go up, it keeps going. It's got a very specific arrangement. It's a repeating pattern in all directions, okay? So let's look at this first unit cell. This is the simple cubic lattice cell. Now, in general, most of the time, students wanna look at this as, oh, hey, it's an atom. And we're just gonna choose this atom and say, hey, it's a repeating atom. But you can't really do that. And the reason is we want to deal with it as a building block. And so the best way to do that is with kind of picking out a cube, a, just like you would do a Lego, it's the building block, okay? And so this is, instead of choosing this whole circular structure here, we are instead gonna choose uh, not this, whole atom here, but rather um, a nice cubic structure that we could use as a building block. Good word, there we go. Now 
now you can kind of see for this structure, whether you chose an atom or the block, it kind of is going to look the same, but it's not really. And it, it doesn't become obvious until we get to the next few videos. But if you look, you can kind of see, let me go back a second. There's eight corners, one eight, um, I'm sorry. Each corner is going to be involved in, um, let me go forward. One, two, three, four above, and one, two, three, four below. So each corner is represented in eight cells or eight unit cells. So when we go to count the number of particles here, it's eight times the one eighth of the corner. Eight times one eighth is one. Now, I know that's hard to see. Give me a second. The other thing I want to show you is that if you just choose any of the particles here, the coordination number is going to be, it comes in contact with this one and this one above and below, this one and this one, left and right, and this one and this one front and back. So it's got a coordination number of six. Now, I think the easiest way to view this is more like this. This better play. There it goes. Okay. So as you're watching this, this is how they make the unit cell. You can kind of see it's cutting away to give that one little building block. And now, how do you know that there's one particle? You can see this is the building block. To look at how there's, we know that there's one particle, one eighth times the eight corners can be recombined into that single particle. Okay, I kind of think this is a little bit easier to see. Now, as we're dealing with coordination numbers, how do we know that the coordination number is six? Again, you have to kind of visualize inside the unit cell itself. So let's talk about this central one comes in contact with the top and bottom, left and right, front and back. And so there's six here, okay? Next type of thing that we need to talk about is uh, the, the packing in that simple cubic unit cell. Now, the most inefficient packing possible is here. Um, and it has to do with the fact that you take this single atom, or a single particle, you put it next to each other, next to each other, and so on, and then you stack them right on top of each other. That's really inefficient because you can kind of see all the space between the particles. It's the same as if you were to try and pack like ping pong balls. See all that space? So only about 52% of the volume of this crystal is occupied. And because of that, because it's just easier to like usually lay particles inside the uh, where did my, there it goes, pointer go, inside these little holes. Um, this is not really seen very much in nature, okay? The next type of unit cell is the cubic unit cell, the, the body-centered cubic unit cell. Um, so here we have two atoms per unit cell. There's one in the middle, and you can kind of see it's touching eight corners. So the coordination number here is eight. Now, if we look at the way we know this is going to pack, you can tell that there's the same as the simple cubic, but now there's something in the middle sitting in that space between the four bottom and four top particles. And so what's going to happen is when we go to make that nice building block, you cut away to get that nice cube. There it goes. And 
Again, the eight corners times one eighth each, you get one particle from the corners, one from the center, okay? Now, if we look at the coordination number, let's just choose one from the corner. You saw how the coordination number of this one was uh, eight, but also here you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the coordination number of both particles is actually eight here. Now, this packing is a little bit more efficient Instead of um, having only particles on top of each other, now we have particles that are going to rest in the little crevices. And so that occupies some of the room. Top and uh, bottom are pretty much the same. Um, first and third rows, I guess I should say. So again, you can kind of see that this is the body centered cube packing. Again, about 68% of the volume is used. You can see the little holes here and here. Not perfect. Usually this is from metals, especially alkali metals, uh, more than anywhere else. Third type of unit cell is the face-centered cubic unit cell. Face-centered cubic unit cell doesn't have the one in the center. It actually has um, the particles on all of the sides. Here we've also got the eight corners. And so we can kind of look at uh, how these guys are going to come together. Now we have four atoms per unit cell and a coordination number of 12. This may go too fast for me, but you can kind of see the particles are on all six faces. So we have half, because the face is cut in half, um, of six, six, one half times six is three, and then eight times the one eighth of the corners is going to be another one. But again, I always think it's easier once you have it kind of like this. So here is your face center cubic unit cell. You have four particles, one of this type, three of the other. In terms of coordination numbers, let's first look at this guy. It comes in contact with the four here, the four up here, and the four down here. So there's a coordination number of 12. Now, face-centered cubic unit cell has um, even more efficiency. It's better packed than anything else. Uh, and that's because you can actually put the particles shifted to occupy more room. It's not ping pong ball by ping pong ball. What you do is you shift them over. Hopefully you guys can kind of catch that. And now the holes are much smaller. And so when you go to layer them, it ends up being uh, how do you say, uh, less space that's empty. So this is also called cubic closest pack. Um, I don't know why they have two different names. It's just the way they do it. For the most part, I'm gonna call it face centered cubic unit cell, but if you experience or see the cubic closest pack, that's really just the face centered cubic unit cell. Usually this is going to be elements or covalent compounds. Occasionally you'll have ionic compounds that do this. It really comes down to the ratio of each type of ion or each type of element that you would need. Okay. So here's our three unit cells. We have the simple cubic, the body centered cubic, and the face centered cubic. <coughs> There's a few different ways I can ask you questions. I could say, you know, how many particles are in a unit cell of a body center cubic unit cell uh, with less repetition in that sentence. And you could say, okay, well, there's one in the middle, eight times one eighth would be two. You could also, I could also ask what the coordination number is. I could ask uh, maybe packing. I probably won't say, you know, here's a unit cell, what type of particles would be here? That's just kind of above. I don't like memorization. Now, we just talked about cubic closest packed. Um, and the idea is when you're packing these unit cells, there's more than one way to do it. You can have uh, four spheres with cubic closest packed, or you can actually have eight spheres with um, hexagonal closest packed, where you have just two repeating units 
we don't really do much with the HCP. Uh, it's just not as common. So for the most part, you know, we'll focus most of our information on cubic closest packed. Um, this is an ABC, ABC type layer where this is two repeating layers instead. Now, when you look at how these unit cells are organized, how they are packed together, what's going to end up happening is we can make, we can draw conclusions about the intermolecular forces that are present. We can talk about the physical and chemical properties. We can talk about the reactivity and we can really start to draw upon what we know to be happening. So let's look at, there we go, some other types of particles really quick. So when we talk about a solid, we just talked about the unit cell, but remember the particles, the solids can be made of just about anything. It can be atoms, ionic crystals, ion, and well, ion can be covalent compounds, it can be molecular compounds, all situated in a way that is going to limit movement. Okay. So if we look at like an ionic compound, here we've got uh, electrostatic interactions. These are intramolecular forces. So these are the strongest forces there are. And so even though they're charged, they are held together and the electrons have already been transferred. They're not moving anymore. They are already in, they already belong to somebody. And so with that in mind, it is going to limit the conductivity it can have that can happen for electricity and heat. And if you've ever like, you know, tried to bend a salt crystal, it's just not going to happen. And instead what happens is they, break, they shatter. And so these are hard and brittle and they have really high melting points. There's virtually no way to melt salt. It just doesn't happen in a kitchen. You have to have it in like really high temperatures. <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> now the arrangement, whether the cations and anions are going to arrange with like a body or a face centered cube is going to completely depend on the relative size of the ions, okay? And so if we kind of look at uh, two different things, we can look at sodium and chlorine. Sodium is really small compared to chlorine, and so it can situate in the holes between, so you end up getting more of a, a body-centered cubic structure. Now, on the other hand, if you look at, what's the next one in here? Oops, I'm sorry. This is uh, the face centered. I was getting ahead of myself. Um, and so you can kind of see that this is going to be a, a different type of arrangement. Now, on the other hand, if you have something like ions that are similar in size, there's a completely different arrangement instead. And so if we look at here, we know that Na and Cl, both this is plus one, minus one, there's a one-to-one -one ratio here. So here we've got one, two, we've got them both on this, the surface, the face. So there's three here and then one here. Um, we also have the sodium in this arrangement where we have uh, this guy shared by four, one up here, one this one, one over here and one above. So four times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, back here, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So you end up getting a nice one-to-one -one ratio when you do all this. There's also one right in the middle. Now, if we look on the other hand, zinc and sulfide. Zinc and sulfide, you have, again, a one-to-one -one ratio, but the ions are similar in size. And so it's a little bit different how they're going to pack. You're not going to have the sodium ions in between every little hole between the chloride. Instead, what's going to happen is it's more of a, um, they each occupy equivalent positions in the lattice itself. And so it's not really as, a, hmm, it's not really as efficient. We'll go with that. 
So that's ionic. It all depends on the ratio of the ions and how things are working. Covalent network solids are um, really they're just one essential molecule that continually bonds in all directions through this patch. They are extremely hard. So if you consider like the allotropes of carbon, carbon can be bonded in a structure like this and be present as diamond. It can be bonded in sheets and be the lubricant of graphite, um, which you guys generally use as your pencil lead. It's extremely hard. These are not going to melt. And again, the electrons are not being, they're not mobile. And so they're going to be poor conductors of electricity and really heat as well. There are some other allotropes of carbon, including like buckyball. This is used primarily in medical applications. Nanotubes are hugely important. Um, the nano field in general is just astronomical right now. Um, but you know, it is what it is. So, and then there's also some um, graphene applications that are being explored, but I won't go into that. You can also have uh, something like boron nitride. And boron nitride is included here because it does almost the exact same thing that carbon does. And so you can have kind of a, not a prickly, but a more three-dimensional structure that is going to be really hard. You can also have flat sheets that can slide against one another. Either way, it's going to be poor conductors of electricity because the covalent bonds are not going to be rearranging. So covalent network solids, here we have diamond, silicon dioxide, which is in the glass, carbon, a silicon carbide, graphite. Um, I really like glass as the example here, just because you can kind of think, well, glass doesn't conduct electricity. Glass doesn't have soft. It's not going to do a lot of things. So it's a good example to kind of consider. Molecular solids, on the other hand, are going to be molecules that are held together by dispersion forces. These are not covalent bonds like with the covalent uh, network solids. These are not electrostatic interactions with the ionic solids. Instead, it is just kind of like how your neighbors are being held together. Like in your lab, for example, your interactions with your neighbors are just kind of weak they're, they're, while they're there. These are generally soft. They have low melting points because the molecules can just fall apart from one another. Those weak interactions don't take much to break apart. Now, because of that, they can be considered electrical insulators. They uh, will allow for a little bit of mo movement, and then that will protect the electricity from really being transmitted. So just like with when we were talking about intermolecular forces, dispersion forces increase with molar mass. And so melting points here are going to increase with molar mass. The bigger the molecule, the more it takes to move it. The higher the dispersion force, the, the less it's going to want to melt. Now, you can change properties by doping or by heating and then cooling. Um, usually, if you heat something up and then cool it down, sometimes the molecular arrangement will shift and allow for a completely different type of set of properties. Um, you can dope with uh, elements that have either fewer or more valence electrons. So if you look at, you know, silicon is in group four, so it's got four valence electrons. Boron has... Um, three. So if you dope silicon with boron, it's called a p-type dopant. Um, an n-type dopant is increasing the number of valence electrons by replacing a silicon with something like phosphorus. This has five instead of the four. The other thing that this is really going to do is it will change those properties. And if you really like, there, there are people that spend their every day looking at this. Once you start understanding the properties of the original solid, and then you look at how the properties of a dopant will change it, you can really tailor make some of these solids 
so that you can get the exact type of uh, properties you want. Metallic solids are usually done. You have metal ions that are sitting next to each other. Now, metals do not really attract each other, you know, positive, positives. Um, instead, what happens is they want to get rid of their electrons anyway. So they typically donate their electrons out to the community. And the attraction to the sea of electrons is what keeps the metal ions close together. So these tend to have a really good, strong interaction, just like uh, ionic compounds. They're, except that here, they're going to be ductile and malleable. They're not going to be brittle the way ions, ionic compounds were. This is um, a nice malleable solid. It's also because the electrons are in motion, this is the only type of solid that can conduct heat and electricity, and it does it readily because the electrons are delocalized. Now, just again, this one electron can be attracting multiple metal ions here. I hope you guys can see my pointer. This electron can be attracting multiple atoms or multiple metal ions. And so you have a ton of electrostatic interactions going on, so they're really strong. Now, anytime we're talking about a solid, it's kind of nice to talk about what types of defects you can have. Now, you can have a vacancy where maybe a particle was excluded for some reason. That will have implications for the types of the strength of the bonds uh, between the neighbors. You can have an interstitial alloy. Um, an inter interstitial, and this is really a terrible photo, guys, but it's the only one I could find that was Creative Commons. An interstitial impurity is when you have something in between the holes. So you can kind of see like this diamond shaped hole right here. If I had a particle that was kind of placed in there. Now interstitial impurities have huge implications for the properties. And so for example, um, steel is an interstitial alloy because you have carbon in between the iron atoms and that is going to increase the strength. The other type of impurity could be a substitution impurity, where you take one out and replace it with another. Generally, these should be the same size. So again, this is a terrible photo, but you know it is what it is. Um, substitutional alloys are things like brass, where you have zinc and copper, which are very similar in size. You take out some of the copper, put in some zinc, and again, it increases the stability, the strength there. So this is kind of my flashcard slide. There's examples of each type of solid. The properties are here. Remember, you know, the only one that um, really conducts electricity pretty well is metallic. Um, most of these are pretty hard. Uh, molecular compounds are the only one that seem to vary. And then, um, you know, it'll, you, you get the idea. So this tells you the particles, the type of attractions, all of it. Now guys, amorphous solids are the ones that do not have a crystalline organization. They are more random. The properties, because of that, the properties are gonna vary pretty significantly. You can't really predict the number of interactions each particle is gonna have. You can't predict the melting point because you don't know the, inter the molecular, intermolecular forces. You can't always um, determine what's going to happen, which is why we don't spend much time on them. So we have, for this unit, talked about the phases of matter. We've discussed intermolecular forces. We've looked at molecular structure and tried to predict those. The thing with solids is now that we know those intermolecular forces, we can really look at those unit structures and I'm sorry, the unit cells, and look at how the, part, the particle packing, the properties are going to vary, and we can really start talking about solids as we go into the next few units. The next video is going to deal with phase transitions and phase diagrams. It's always a lot of fun.